Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I want to start off today by thanking you for joining us and participating in our Stop the Bleed webinar. Uh, as you may know, this is uh, Stop the Bleed month in May. Uh, this is something that we do every year. Uh, we're happy to have Dr. Joseph Bart here with us today. Uh, Dr. Bart is dual board certified in emergency medicine, excuse me, emergency medicine and emergency medical services and he has specialized training in many areas of operational emergency services. In today's webinar, Dr. Bart will discuss how we can empower lay rescuers to help bridge the gap in response time when an emergency occurs. We're also excited to be able to give away three mobilized rescue system compact kits, which have been generously donated by our friends at Zoll Medical uh, Zoll Medical is also our presenting partner in today's webinar. We will be giving these kits away to uh, three lucky winners who are listening live today, and we will announce those winners at the end of today's webinar. Before I turn the time over to Dr. Bart, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. Uh, first, we will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. Uh, Dr. Bart will be speaking for around 45 minutes, and after he has finished his presentation, uh, we will answer the questions in the order in which they were received. This webinar will, of course, be recorded, and a link to it will be posted to our schoolhealth.com website, and we will make the, uh, the recording available to you for future playback. We will be sending out an email this afternoon, uh, which will have a link to the, the recorded webinar, and it will also contain your certificate of attendance for attending the webinar today. And again, you should receive that email this afternoon. And then lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please contact GoToWebinar directly at 855-352. 9003. Again, that number for GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now we'll turn the time over to Dr. Bart. Thank you very much, Ryan, um, for the introduction, and thanks everybody for joining us today um, to talk about integration of our lay rescuers into a plan for school emergencies. Again, my name is Joe Bart. I'm a clinically practicing emergency physician in sunny Buffalo, New York, um, where you joined us today. So good afternoon. Um, some of my background is um, I have a background in sports medicine. So um, a good hello out there to all my athletic training colleagues from the past. Um, I was also a paramedic. I do a variety of EMS medical direction, um, clinically practicing in a level one trauma center. Um, uh, from a disclosure perspective, I'm also an original contributor and medical director for mobilized rescue systems and a paid consultant for Zoll Medical. So let's talk about our objectives on this day. Um, when integrating lay rescuers into response for so your, cam your campus response planning, I guess that's where we'll put the setting here. Um, I wanna explain to you and have you understand this gap of response in pre-hospital environment. And it might come to a surprise to you, to be honest, it came to a bit of a surprise to me as we uncovered what this gap was. So I'll explain a lot more about what that means. Um, I wanna talk about empowering lay rescuers. Um, there's things that lay rescuers wanna get involved in. There's some reluctancies and when they're going to get involved in medical emergencies and maybe some strategies that we can all use to try to work our way around that. Um, after that, let's let's build an algorithm. Let's talk about some time sensitive conditions and when lay rescuers are gonna be involved through camp campus emergencies and emergencies within the community, what type of equipment do they need? What type of things should they focus in on? It's not just necessarily a Band-Aid kit. Now those have their uses, um, but we need to talk about your medical emergencies and understanding this idea of the gap of response and uh, emergencies. Uh, empowerment of responders, uh, as far as your emergency action plan, you can actually institute policies in which lay rescuers or non-trained uh, professional emergency responders are going to be part of your emergency action response plans. So let's talk about this response gap. So where can your bystanders make a difference? Um, what exactly is our problem here? So let me frame this for you. Put yourself at a medical emergency location. If you've ever unfortunately had to be part of that before where you have to call 911, whether you're an emergency responder or not, put yourself there for just a moment. I'm sorry if that's uncomfortable, but you had to call 911 for something. It's a car accident. It was some other medical emergency, somebody unconscious, seizure, whatever it might be. 
put yourself back into that place, okay? So we have the emergency medical problem that's going on at whatever location. And then from there, everybody seemingly has access to calling 911. So this is not back 50 years ago in which we only had landline access. Uh, everybody has a cell phone. There's no question there that the access to the 911 system is out there. So we can probably cut down the time for response just because everybody has a cell phone that you're able to activate the system. From there, where does, where does your 911 call go? So it's gonna go to a dispatch center where there's a dispatcher sitting there. I don't know why they always have 12 TV screens. I think one of them's playing online poker, but they're there ready to receive your call. They're gonna ask you an abundance of questions. From there, it goes on to receiving your ambulance, all right? So this is the process of what happens when you activate an emergency plan through 911 system. So from your emergency medical location, whatever that problem is, to the time somebody calls 911 is a huge unknown variable. There's the unknown time here because we just don't know, are you standing next to the person? Did you see it happen? Was it a passerby? Is it an unknown thing where you just happen to stumble upon a medical emergency? Um, whatever it might be. So we really can't quantify that thing. Uh, but let's just say it's somewhere around 60 seconds or so, just, just for the purpose of talking here. So within 60 seconds time, let's say it's a good day, and we've got 911, not a good day necessarily, but we've got 911 activated. From that time frame, um, you enter into a queue, depending on where you are, if it's an urban environment, if it's a really busy system, if it's a super busy time of the day, uh, 30, 60 seconds or so from your 911 access point to talking with the dispatcher themselves. Then they're gonna start to ask you some questions. And if you've ever been there before, it, it seems like an eternity. They ask you who you are and where you are and where you're calling from, when all you want to go is like, I just need help, just send me an ambulance, tell me what to do. Um, so let's just say around 30 to 60 seconds for this. And again, these are not fixed times, but I'm just trying to build in a, a scope of how long does it take to get through the emergency response plan. And after that, depending on what system you're in. So if you're in a, uh, an urban environment where there's a municipal response from a fire department or a third service ambulance or ambulances that are uh, contracted that are just sitting on street corners, um, kind of waiting to respond, or it's a volunteer system, even out into the rural side, in which people have to come from home, They've got to get in their car, drive to their, their fire department, pick up the apparatus, and then start to respond. Um, so there are a lot of variables that exist there as well. So from that purpose of dispatching, depending again on how many calls might be dispatched at the same time, there's anywhere between 30 seconds and four plus minutes just to get that dispatcher to activate the ambulance to respond, give them kind of call information, supplemental and such. So this dotted line that worked its way in here is this variable I want to I want to talk about called the gap. So this average response time is in the urban environments so or your city related environments. This is seven to nine minutes or so. Uh, Ten to fifteen minutes, roughly in a suburban area. You could go upwards of twenty minutes to your rural areas. This is your in totality. This is your emergency medical response plan when you activate nine one one any given day of the week. So let's talk about this gap in response. So ideally what we're looking for, right, is we want the ambulance to be doing patient care. So when we activate them, we want first responders, we want EMTs and paramedics to be assessing somebody and delivering patient care. So in between them, if we separate them and we design what we call is this gap, what we're, I'm actually referring to is this average of nine minutes in between. So we talk about all the different response areas. So this is when everything is going perfectly well. It's completely normal, um, and your response time is that for your ambulance to be activated with all the information they need to go to delivering patient care. And actually, if we back this back one second, it's the it's the delivery of the care. Um, I guess that would predicate on that the person they're there assessing the person and they're actually delivering the care at the time. So this is actually just talking about response times. We'll talk about some strategies here in a few moments. But what I'm getting at here is for them to arrive on location. It doesn't mean they're arriving at the patient's side, just arriving on location. So I thought about this as a prior uh, EMT and a paramedic and as an emergency physician now and said, geez, there, is there really something within our emergency response activation in which there is a, there's a, this gap that exists? Uh, a time response in which everything is going the way it should be and you're literally sitting there waiting for help to arrive. Now, whether you're the responder or not, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but in between, from the point of injury or illness, this gap of, of patient care not being delivered while everybody's responding to you 
are there time sensitive medical conditions that could be evaluated and need to be treated on patients in between when EMS is activated and when they actually arrive to the site? And who's going to do that care? So some of the time sensitive conditions I want us to, to talk about, and actually the most important we're going to talk about today, are things like major bleeding, respiratory compromise, and cardiac emergencies. I think everybody's very familiar with cardiac emergencies with the institution of public access defibrillation and the AED programs that exist, all that lay rescuer. We're gonna take that back a few steps and see where else we can use it. So where your minutes matter most on time sensitive medical control? Uh, massive and uncontrolled bleeding, and it is stop the bleeding month, so we're gonna, we're gonna focus a little bit on that. How do we define massive uncontrolled bleeding? I think I probably have a different definition of what massive uncontrolled bleeding is. Um, everybody will, will look at that a little bit differently. I think in general, what we're talking about is continuous bleeding that is uncontrolled, not necessarily pumping or squirting. That's difficult um, because it's so subjective. Yeah, if you've got medical training, you understand what a large pool of blood exists like. Um, if you don't, you might be looking at this saying, I'm not really sure what I, I could really define what massive bleeding is. I think if we start with the principle that uncontrolled or a large amount of bleeding could have uh, bad outcomes, we can start there for lay rescuers. Respiratory failure, inclusive of choking, um, these types of medical emergencies, they have time related to them. So as time passes on, things could potentially get worse. That's what we're trying to institute um, some degree of preparedness for on behalf of lay rescuers. Um, certainly cardiac arrest, um, I, I think that that's the catalyst of this conversation in the first place. Um, if we didn't use that as, as our jump off point, I'm not sure what other better example I could use as far as management of cardiac arrest and lay rescuer responses. Um, so if we couple this together with our average response time, and again, as we pointed out, our average response time here of your seven to 14 minutes, if we put it all together, um, that's just to get EMS to respond. And, and again, we're talking about some of these things over here to the left of uncontrolled major bleeding, uh, respiratory failure and choking and cardiac arrest. Could somebody place their hands on a patient and do an assessment and start to control those things while EMS is responding. There wasn't a delay, it's just while they're responding. Um, so as we talk about the sensitivity and the time of that, I'll, I'll jump forward here a little bit. So as we discuss this a little more on the response times, um, now we need to put this with the medicine. And I prioritized a few things for you. Uh, mostly this is trauma. So for the age groups that we're talking about on school campuses um, and otherwise, age 140 to 44, your number one cause of death is trauma. So if we put that all together with American College of Surgeons data, the traumatic deaths of you know, potentially upwards of 30,000 per year um, were preventable possibly if care was provided by someone at the scene. Now I find that interesting. They didn't say, they didn't say the nurse, they didn't say a doctor, they didn't say athletic trainer, they didn't say the CPR instructor, they didn't say, um, any other you know, teacher or personnel or principal, they said someone. And the creative language behind that probably wasn't uh, by accident. It's to suggest that if somebody were there to do something, even if it wasn't the perfect thing, to intervene a little bit sooner, are these preventable traumatic dots? I think it's an interesting question. So as we, as we use this, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind to suggest who else could we use in your emergency action plans to help decrease that number, because I, I think that's what we're really trying to achieve. We all feel the right here, and I do have another slide on this. We talk about the training itself. Um, it's gonna sound like I'm picking on training and I am not. So I'll use that as my disclaimer first. Um, we're not saying that training is ineffective. It is super effective. And training people uh, to be up on CPR and first aid skills is certainly the, the, the first place for you to start. The more training we can get out there, the more trained responders, uh, the less, thus likelihood we are having gaps in our emergency action response plan. Um, what we will take a little bit of a poke at is what do you do with that training going forward? Um, and I will, there's another slide on that that we'll just get right back to this. So again, about your gap, um, let's talk about some reasons why 911 is called because it's not necessarily always uh, just cardiac arrest or bleeding control or otherwise. We have to focus in on, if we're really gonna look at our emergency action plan, what are the things that most commonly 911 is activated for. So it's it's trouble breathing, it's opiate overdoses. I think there's a lot of preparedness when it comes to schools and school campuses um, on behalf of opiate overdoses and naloxone and the, the prescription de-identification of not only naloxone for that, but EpiPens for anaphylaxis. Um, that's another one. 
seizures, pains, envenomations, burns. I don't think anybody's really having super bad outcomes for fractures and sprains initially. Um, but again, we need to build this into a timeline to suggest that are, are we providing the right access for identification of the reasons why somebody has to call 911 in the first place, um, the responders that are there and to make sure that they have the right equipment to do the job. If we take all of those things in totality, we're gonna start building a better response plan. And again, this is not the knock on uh, the first aid kit that's in the, uh, the nice box that sits on a corner that has um, maybe a, a breathing mask or some band-aids in it. Uh, this is to suggest that there are, there are time sensitive conditions that are beyond that that we at least have to recognize as a, as a response activation plan so that we're prepared for those things. This is a super sensitive topic. Um, when we talk about preparedness, um, we have to talk about some of the institutions of um, when access might be delayed. Um, so as I already staged this, your access to ambulances um, has a response time gap just because they're responding. In a situation like this, so one of my, uh, my, my former jobs, I should so as I was working with the Department of Homeland Security to develop rescue task force training specifically for law enforcement and EMS providers to teach them to learn to, to work together uh, to respond to these types of active shooter um, scenarios. Let me give you the perspective. Um, there is a danger or a threat actively inside your campus or building. You could have 13 ambulances waiting in the driveway and they're not coming in. So who's going to deliver the medical care there? And are there time-sensitive medical conditions still that somebody who's there could start delivering that assessment or their care ahead of time? There's still been seven of these in the past 12 months. And again, I understand there's a lot of sensitivity here, but anybody who works on a campus or a school or a building or an office or complex has already had some sensitivity behind um, the, the fortification of not only your security, but develop emergency action plans related to responding to this type of thing. And if, and if you haven't, it's time to have that hard conversation about how you would handle this and potentially where your medical interventions could start. Let's talk for a moment on trained versus untrained responders and how to engage that lay rescuer. All right, so using what works, um, I talked about this um, probably a few moments ago here of out of hospital cardiac arrest. Obviously, when we use this, uh, this example of out of hospital cardiac arrest and your public access to, access to fibrillation, the use of bystanders in AED super, uh, it's for your CPR astronomically improved our outcomes. So it's your sudden cardiac arrest with the use of lay rescuers, the AEDs, the PAD programs, whether trained or not trained or just familiarization, we all understand that if we can put hands on a chest and we can start CPR and, and compressions and we get early access to AEDs and defibrillation, that's a big win. That's where you have your return to spontaneous circulation. That's where we have our best outcomes. So along the way, I think the challenge was here, like where else can we engage lay rescuers to do? One of my, my personal interests is how far can I take a lay rescuer to the point where a little bit of familiarization to, can we train them to do certain activities that medical professionals feel comfortable with? And furthermore, how much training do they need? It, can it be on the spot training? Can it be just as in, uh, just in time training? Can it be um, instructions provided that are written? Can it be videos? Um, can it be an application? Can it be some equipment that gets paired together to help lay rescuers respond when they really don't know what to do? So off of that, I had to ask myself the question, like, well, then why, why don't bystanders get involved? Like, what are the things that bystanders are afraid of? So it's not what you might think, because I originally thought, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I use my wife as an example here. She's not in medicine at all. She's somewhere around the house. And does she want to get involved in lay rescue or response? I'm thinking, geez, she probably doesn't like, like the blood and guts. She's not into that. I think vomit would really scare her away. Um, it's not that. I thought all those same things, because I don't, I don't necessarily always love that stuff either. But the things that bystanders were afraid of were more of the, I don't really know what to do. And if, if I do something and I get involved here, could I harm somebody? Could I do the wrong thing and all of a sudden, like, I'm in trouble for it? What if I get sued? Um, all these things together were these barriers for why bystanders chose to get involved or not get involved. Um, and then we had to look at them strategically and say, how can we overcome some of these barriers to allow lay rescuers to become engaged? Because as we talked about before for the traumatic data from the American College of Surgeons, it said somebody if somebody chose to get involved. So that somebody 
many times can be a lay rescuer or a bystander and understanding what some of their barriers are might help them to be engaged with this. So what do we do with when they don't know? Well, we, we teach them or we provide them equipment or training or somehow facilitate that they're going to do the right thing. When it comes to the I'm afraid to do damage or will I get sued, um, just about every state here there has, there's some nuances, but they're good Samaritan laws uh, that exist there and they exist for a reason. Even if you are a, a trained medical responder and you have a license, um, unless you have a duty to act, i.e. you're at work and you're being paid to do a certain job. So if you're, um, if you're the nurse in the school, you're being paid to be a nurse in the school, there's a bit of a duty to act. Once you get in your car and go home, same thing would be for me, and there's a car accident, I could just sort of drive right by. Now I would feel a little bit weird about that, and I'm kind of being a jerk if I did it. I'd probably get a stop to help, but regardless of the outcome, if you're a good Samaritan, um, just about every state out there for their legislation uh, suggests that you are not gonna be liable for the outcomes when you did not have a duty to act because your intention was to help somebody outside of gross negligence, of course. So you may be asking yourself this, and I've kind of, I've kind of hinted at this. I'm a trained professional. I'm a first responder. I'm a medical professional. I am, I am a nurse. I'm an athletic trainer. I am trained in CPR and first aid. I am a lifeguard. I'm a lifeguard instructor, somewhere along those lines. So why is this important to me? So for trained responders, we have to ask a couple of things. So your best case scenario, I think, is a, a trained responder such as yourself, who's involved in emergency action plans, is assessing and treating a patient in under 60 seconds. If that happened universally, I think that's fantastic. Then, then almost we're done talking about how else can we engage other people. But there's a bit of a fact here. Being the first to respond is certainly just a matter of circumstance and timing. Um, either you're there when it initially happened or you're not. And that just seems very circumstantial to me. I don't necessarily like circumstance um, when I'm in the business of preparing. So as we talk about preparation, well over 60% of sudden illness and injury, um, the, the treatment of that and the responder to that is not a trained responder, it's a coworker, it's a teacher, it's a faculty member, it's childcare, um, it's family, or it's simply just a stranger who decided to get involved. So your best case again is everyone is trained to be a responder. So everybody can be a rescuer. That sounds fantastic too. So we say, I'm gonna train everybody as a CPR responder. I'm gonna train everybody on AED. I'm gonna train everybody to a certain capacity of first aid. In fact, we're gonna go further than that. We're gonna make them all EMTs and say that everybody can be a trained rescuer. And that, that, sounds, that sounds great. Um, but for most non-professional uh, responder type courses, the number one reason why lay rescuer is reluctant to get involved is they don't know what to do. So what happens on day one? Say we did all the first aid, we did all the CPR and AEG training today. Then this week, your institution is the safest it will ever be. Everybody knows what to do. It's at the front burner. They're ready to respond. They hear the activation of emergency if you're, if you're that robust um, to get everybody to respond. And you have a lot of help, a lot of people who want to get engaged. But recall, we talked about the barriers of what a lay rescuer is getting involved in and sometimes why they don't want to be involved. And it mostly comes down to, I don't know what to do. So that reluctancy is that I don't know what to do, I'm gonna do something wrong or I'm gonna hurt somebody. And you can see how this, uh, this kind of snowballs here. Your first aid training uh, fades over time and makes your, your lay rescuers less competent to actually get involved. So let's quantify that a little bit because otherwise it sounds like I'm just being subjective. Um, so there are studies that have looked at this that talked about CPR and AD uh, retention of training. So after about 12 months, after you do your, your training. And again, certifications last for sometimes two, three, sometimes four years um, as far as their retention. I'm not saying that that goes away completely, but after three months time, you'll see there on the right there, about 33% of those responders that were trained, who haven't used it in between are not trained professional responders, 33% have retained that afterwards. And this comes by cognitive skills. This is also by actually doing physical application of skills. Um, and then, after about 12 months or so, it's down to 10%. So you might look at it and say, geez, like we're spending a lot of time and effort and money on behalf of CPR and AED training. I'm not suggesting that you don't do that. So don't get me wrong. I think that training is, is wonderful. What I am suggesting is that the, the reintroduction of your emergency action plan on behalf of who's gonna respond within your organization should probably occur a little more frequently than the three-year certification that's going to last. When it comes to your actual participants, 
um, achieving what they want to do here, they, they may they may be reluctant only for a few reasons. You know, they remember going through the CPR training, and I, and I guess if it's lay rescuer and it's hands only CPR, the instructions are pretty simple, right? And in fact, you probably have taught these classes when you say, put your hands on the chest, you put them here, you push hard, you push fast, and you do so until you can't anymore, or somebody comes to help, or an AED arrives. All right, it seems pretty simple. But if we go a little bit further into BLS level training, that person is thinking, geez, is it five to one? No, it's five to two. It's 30 to two. No, you do one, I do 30, I'll do 40 of those, and we'll do seven cycles and four cycles. You can see how this works, right? So at the end of it, if they're reluctant on what to do and they just don't know, there might be that bit of hesitation. What I'm trying to do is dissolve that barrier of hesitation so that we can engage that lay rescuer to be a better responder within a system while perhaps a trained provider such as yourself, if you're listening, um, is able to respond from another side of the campus or otherwise wherever you're coming from. Another thing to discuss here is a pretty well-documented thing called the bystander effect. Um, and you see, you see, this nice man here laying flat on his back with his nice briefcase, and there's a guy over top of him going, I, is he sleeping? I don't know if he's sleeping. And the other guy's pointing at him going, see, I really like this guy's tie. And then there's a lady kind of pointing down at his face going, I think I might know him. He goes to my church. But nobody's getting involved. They're all standing around and watching. Maybe somebody has their cell phone out, and they decided to record it, but they didn't decide to get involved. So the bystander effect suggests that when there's other people around, the other individuals assume, Somebody's going to help them, right? So I don't have to do it. I don't have to get involved because somebody else is going to help. He's got to have some friends here. Look, he looks, he's a dapper man. it has got to be a friend here that's going to be willing to help him. So they just don't get involved. So we actually find that more times where there's a one-on-one -on -one or a two-to-one where there's a smaller ratio of individuals that are lay rescuers, they will get involved because they're looking around um, saying there's really nobody else to help right now. It's got to be me. In this situation, um, the bystanders are all they're hesitant, there's somebody, I know there's somebody that wants to jump out of this crowd and help, but we have to be able to empower that individual to say that, you know what, today I'm gonna be the rescuer because they might just be making the difference for this person. So how do we overcome the bystander effect? Well, training is paramount. I think getting training out there um, to empower individuals is certainly, um, it's certainly tat them out. Uh, we've done this for years. We understand that training individuals will empower them um, on behalf of you know, their own intelligence and confidence um, to get in there and respond as a trained provider. Certainly the experience is gonna go along with it. With a bit of hesitation to understand what we just talked about before, that does kind of fade over time. Um, the equipment to do so, we will talk about in just a few moments here. And again, the empowerment is the encouragement to look and say, listen, I may be the trained responder on my campus. I may be that individual who says, I have no problem getting involved here. Um, if, if if, if you're in emergency medical services or otherwise, you understand that you can eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich over stop somebody shot in the chest. It sounds awful, but we could do it. So I don't have a problem being involved, but how do I obtain the power and assistance from those individuals who think they want to help and they feel like they should help, but they don't necessarily know what to do? How do we get them involved? So let's talk about building your response plan and getting those um, those lay rescuers involved. I'm gonna move on to the, we talked about the concept here. We talked about the gap. So there's a need, there's understanding that there's a gap in when ambulances are on their way and when there's supposed to be patient care delivered and some time sensitive medical conditions in between. Let's talk about the medicine that we should be prioritizing on. And then we can all sort of circle back around and say, is this good for lay rescuers? Is this too much for them? Do we think we can accomplish this? Um, so what exactly are their priorities? When I teach this to EMTs, we try to simplify the idea of triage. And you see on the right graph there, it says priority one. I tell them the whole point of triage is to hunt for the reds. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the highest priority medical conditions that exist in a crowd of people, whether it's one person or, or several. And I remember um, re responding to, actually back in the athletic training days, I remember responding to a, a soccer field um, somebody thought there was a lightning strike. Actually, what it was is they had um, they had a soccer net that had like the goalposts that were the verticals as well, kind of a dual purpose. And somebody pushed it into a power line and it just shot energy all over the place and ended up looking like it was going to be MCI. Everybody was fine. Um, but from that perspective, you have to learn the idea of triage becomes important as well. It's not always just one patient. So um, can a lay rescuer do this? Would they even know what to do? Or are they just gonna get to the first patient and say, I'm gonna just take care of this one uh, first? Or is there a system of response that we can teach lay rescuers as well? 
And how would they engage themselves to prioritize and treat medical emergencies? Would they know with a box full of equipment um, or something hung onto a wall that they're supposed to treat certain medical conditions first? And what, are, what does the timeline look like on that? And we'll get to that in just a moment. Can these skills be taught with just-in-time instruction? I think is, is a super valuable question. I can't answer that specifically on everything, but I can tell you it's very intriguing. I watched a lot of Ray Rutley rescuers get involved in, in eliminating some of the barriers and I watched them do some training. And people that have had not had any medical experience at all, in fact, they were terrified, were able to follow some simple instructions when they, when they read them and they applied what we thought as medical professionals was the right priority of, of instruction. So your principle of design here, I want you to, if you've never heard of this before, this is March E, some teachers just call it just March E. So March E uh, is a concept designed by the, uh, it's down at the bottom there, got a little washed out, by the uh, Trauma Emergency Casualty Care. This is an adaptation of a military concept called TCCC, which is Trauma Combat Casualty Care. Um, the Trauma Emergency Casualty Care here had to take a few adaptations on behalf of uh, that we have more than just a, a young, healthy soldier population in battle conditions, but we have elderly, we have pediatric populations, and we have an urban environment in which emergency medical services are doing most of everything. Uh, so what does March E stand for? We will jump in here. So um, March E stands for, on, on, on the left side, massive bleeding, airway, respirations, circulation, hypothermia and head injury, and then there's everything else. If we pair the same colors here on behalf of what we talked about for triage, it's a design principle. Massive bleeding, you would assume is what? That's my priority one stuff. We talk about the most time sensitive conditions first. I guess that what I'm asking is, you gotta think of what's gonna, what's gonna kill you the quickest. So your most time sensitive conditions in March E are your massive bleeding. Then after that, we talk about airway, respiration, circulation, um, and then towards the end of this, we talk about hypothermia, head injuries, and then the everything else category. So it does have principles designed from what triage is, and it makes sense that we're hunting for the reds. So massive bleeding, airway, respiratory, circulation, hypothermia, head injury, and everything else. I'll give you a moment to process that. And again, this will all be uh, referenced for you. Uh, afterwards to take a uh, peek at, you don't have to write it all down now. So if we look at March E as now a timeline, I want you to think of the things all the way to the left we just mentioned, that was priority one reds, that M of massive bleeding. This is on the left, things that can kill you quickly. And on the right, things that can be delayed. They're medical emergencies, no doubt. They need medical treatment. They're likely headed to the emergency department, but they're delayed medical emergencies. And along the bottom here, we have a timeline. So I wanna build this timeline so that you can start to understand, I think you might understand where I'm going with this, of, of your time-sensitive medical conditions. Zero to five minutes is your bleeding emergency. So what we're talking about here is not things from the torso or internal bleeding. There's really not a whole lot that we can do about that in the pre-hospital environment. Um, we're talking about extremity blood loss. So major blood loss from extremities. And you may be thinking too, like, Okay, well, what are the things we have for that? I'll talk about the equipment in a moment and maybe some of the barriers for that. So um, perhaps put yourself in the mind frame of what equipment do I have available to either myself or my campus or medical emergencies, whether it's lay rescue or, or professional or otherwise, what things do I have around to treat these medical priorities on the time frame where I'm gonna lay it out for you where I think the importance is. So zero to five minutes is your major bleeding. And then we get around the airway stuff. So airway stuff, obviously you want to intervene on airways as quickly as possible, but your five to eight minute problem here is suggestive that after that time frame, when you have inadequate respirations, we're talking about hypoxia and its institution within the body and its major systems, particularly the brain and the heart itself, within that time frame, um, you do have some buffering built into the, the human bodies, but after about five to eight minutes, it becomes permanent cellular damage. Eight to 10 minutes is development of uh, your, your respiratory conditions. So um, for penetrating chest wounds is one of the things we talk about. For holes into the lung, it's called a pneumothorax, pneumo being air, thorax being chest. So there's air in the chest because something punctured the lung. Um, at some point, you could have enough respirations going in and out of there where basically air comes in through the hole, but it doesn't escape. In through the hole, it doesn't escape. You do that a whole bunch of times over normal respirations at five to 10 minutes, 
and you develop an increased amount of air in that one side of the chest that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually it pushes on what? The big pumpy thing in the middle. So your heart has an inability then because there's too much pressure built up to then circulate blood around the rest of your body. That takes your pneumothorax and calls a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is deadly. It takes a little time for that to build up. There's no Hollywood involved here. Um, it takes some time to build up from an injury to a lung from that matter. It's not a lot of time, but it's not your major bleeding time. And then that hypothermia, head injury, everything else categories are, are your fractures. Um, it, sometimes it's it, it stings and venomations that are not airway. Um, it's your chest pains. Many times, you know, seizures will fall into that or syncope related conditions. Um, there are other things that exist that are medical emergencies, but they're not the medical emergencies in which you necessarily need to engage lay rescuers upon, at least not for a recognition perspective. So if we talk about these things towards the left, I think that's where I wanna focus. Um, we talked about what first? It was the delay in the ambulance getting there. And again, not because the ambulance was delayed for another reason, that could be a lot of uh, a lot of variety of reasons, but because the ambulance is simply just on its way, everyday traffic. And we say, what are those things along the way we have to prepare for with massive bleeding, airway, respirations, that zero to nine minute problem? So this is when we start talking about the engagement of the lay rescuer itself. If we're going to get a lay rescuer involved, what are the things we care about the most? What are the stuff that we want to prepare a lay rescuer to assist with, even if they're not doing a perfect job? Let's be honest. If, if you've ever placed a tourniquet on somebody before, you need some familiarization, a little bit of how to get the bulk around and tighten up and twist the crank. Um, and if you've never done that before, you may fumble through it. But a tourniquet that's placed on that is not 100% effective is probably still better than no tourniquet at all. I think we'd agree with that. So this area over here, with your massive bleeding airway and your respiratory concerns, I specifically put a little box around that saying that your zero minute problem of time and injury, when, when a lay rescuer or even a professional rescuer is there, up to your nine minutes where ambulances are typically going to take over, those are your time sensitive medical conditions based off a triage and an emergency medical perspective. So the understanding here is that I'm not just making it up, I'm not just saying like these are the priorities here, we're building this on a timeline so we can suggest that um, if you're going to institute policies, practices, and changes, particularly engagement of lay rescuers in your emergency action response plan, this is the place to do it. You do it with massive bleeding and airway and respiratory concerns. So let's tether that with the equipment you might need to get this job done. So from the Marchie perspective, let's start with the M for massive bleeding. Um, things like tourniquets, hemostatic dressings, pressure dressings and direct pressure, kind of in that order. Um, when we talk about massive bleeding, and again, I think I brought up that it was subjective. Everybody's impression about what massive or uncontrolled bleeding is might be a little bit different. And I think tourniquets got a bad rap a long time ago. Um, we have a lot of data that came out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in particular, and it talks about extremity wounds that were amenable to tourniquets. When I started practicing as a paramedic, I was still being taught that if you put a tourniquet on an extremity, you might as well kiss that extremity goodbye because it's gonna cause such an ischemic response, we're gonna to have to cut off the limb. And we found through, um, through most studies that that was just anecdotal. That was what people thought. We're using tourniquets in a medical world all the time. If you've ever had a procedure done um, to like a distal extremity or otherwise, they need to get the blood out if you're gonna have a surgery or an operation. So they place tourniquets to prevent bleeding that are active there for you know an hour, two hours. You know, it's so tourniquets themselves are not leading to an ischemic condition in which somebody's gonna have to cut off a limb. So I just want to dismiss that. Tourniquets are highly effective uh, when placed on extremities for control of extremity blood loss. And if we're saying that massive bleeding is the biggest priority and the biggest concern here, that for your zero to five minute problem, that's a really tight window. And you're saying, do I want to worry about their extremity or do I want to save their life from bleeding? I hope you choose tourniquet. Hemostatic dressings are um, the next empowerment behind just dressings themselves. Um, direct pressure with a dressing onto a blood vessel. Again, it's it's nothing, it, it's nothing groundbreaking. We're trying to take a blood vessel and squish it up against the bone to stop the bleeding there. Um, the hemostatic dressings have this, um, many times a chemical, um, a, a clay substance or something that's organic that can allow blood to collect on it and form a blood clot. So it's it's a better it's a better device if you have that 
Um, pressure dressings of again holding some pressure on it or just direct pressure with the gloved hand. Um, those are all changes for massive bleeding. For your airway and circulation problem, we're talking about opening the airway. Um, CPR, AED, well, that came in there twice. Um, chest pain and shortness of breath, allergic reactions, those types of things. So this is all airway related compromise and emergency. And I think I mentioned before that about your six, seven, eight minutes is when you start having hypoxic brain related injuries um, where we can't reverse that. So up until that time, um, most adults can compensate to a certain degree. And again, these are averages. This is not for everybody. Um, and we might talk about opening airway. So if, if you are a trained responder, particularly for um, those trained in sports medicine, I'm gonna say something that's gonna, that's gonna go right up, the, right up your back, so to speak, and pun intended. When we talk about cervical spine injuries and selective spinal mobilization and selective um, and spinal motion restriction and the injuries from that, um, and I'm gonna suggest that in a lay rescue or open an airway with a head tilt chin lift maneuver, um, that, that might cause some, some pause here. Um, the reason why I, I think that as, as a good management or an acceptable management for a lay rescuer is because without the training to do a modified jaw thrust maneuver um, in a, even a semi-conscious, but certainly an unconscious patient, um, it's, it's not the type of skill that we're able to have lay rescuers produce with any type of valid results. So they're just not able to do that. And I guess my challenge here is to suggest that if somebody's unconscious and not breathing as a result of a cervical spine injury, then some manipulation of their airway to try to deliver, whether it might be rescue breaths or simply open up their airway, isn't, isn't as likely to create um, worsening of a condition. But if they're not breathing, we all know what the end result is. Um, for your CPR and AED, I think everybody universally probably has a plan for that. They understand that CPR and hands-only um, compressions, and I think everybody's emergency action plan, um, if you don't, you absolutely should, but everybody's usually um, has some degree of an AED incorporated into that, whether it's on a field or management, but everybody seems to know where they are. Um, I think a good rule of thumb too is to understand that AEDs in their access, you should probably have about a three minute turnaround for your AED. So that might help you to look at your, uh, look at the conditions of where your AEDs are on your campus or in a building or an office space to understand that you can go and get it and bring it back in that time frame. Um, just chest pain, shortness of breath, allergic reactions are related to um, your airway um, is, is an institution of paying attention to uh, airway compromise. Um, opiate overdoses is something that lay rescuers have been phenomenally good at. Um, take this medicine and squirt it up somebody's nose. End of treatment. Who can't be taught how to do that? Is it life-saving? 100%. I see it every single day that the management of, uh, of opiate overdoses with, um, with naloxone internasally um, has, has revolutionized our opportunity to respond to these types of emergencies. And we are saving lives every day with those types of uh, those types of changes. Oops, something happened here. All right, we'll keep moving on here. Um, hypothermia, head injury, and everything else. These are your, uh, your, sp your spinal motion restriction with your uh, fractures and your splinting, everything that happens uh, after those other uh, major conditions have already been um, looked at. And this is when you can start doing things of fracture splinting and worry about um, immobilization, those types of things afterwards. These are with conscious and alert patients. Um, we have a little bit more time to do that. And again, for institution of lay rescuers, um, this is probably not something they're going to be involved with. I'm gonna have to restart this. My apologies. So your emergency action plan, uh, when it comes down to it, um, we talk about getting more lay rescuers involved and, and, and how does that work for your emergency action plan um, as far as bringing more people to the table. Um, workplace side of it, there's generally 100 responders or so um, which you can activate that. And, and the reason why I want to bring this to your attention is that if we can force multiply the emergency action responders into your system, you're just going to improve the likelihood of survivability and better access to healthcare within that program. Um, with schools themselves, anywhere from 500 um, or so responders, I'm going to get right out of this and just show you this. Um, 
what are you talking about? Universities, um, 100, 5,000 even, um, in airports, uh, 1,000 plus responders or so. Um, we want to fill the gap. So when we talk about filling the gap itself, it's um, it's the training, uh, it's your equipment. So we first I'll start with training. I don't want you to, to not have any gaps in, in your medical response. Um, the, the training I think is very important to make sure that you can continue um, responding the way you do CPR and ED classes. Uh, again, are, are, are your main catalyst to all of that. Um, the equipment when it comes down to it, um, you have to have the right equipment to get the job done. So this is my challenge to you um, to talk with your school health representative to make sure that your equipment is available and your equipment that it's valid, that you don't just have a box full of stuff that nobody ever looks at. Sometimes it expires, sometimes it doesn't. But I want that equipment to work on what we just talked about with these with the March E. Um, if you use that as your acronym to make sure that those that is the prioritization of how you're able to actually respond to medical emergencies. Um, communication is very important on the sense of everybody has to know what the emergency response plan is and how to activate that medical emergency. Um, if it's a if it's a potential where somebody is supposed to be involved in the plan, then they need to know that. Um, if there's a certain number or a certain security program that needs to work within a campus um, to activate the emergency, that's great. Um, another form of communication is if it's not part of your response plan for somebody to be a waiver for an ambulance, then please work to institute that because the idea of an ambulance responding and getting on location, sitting in your driveway, waiting for somebody to flag them down, doesn't necessarily help your cause. So they're there, but they don't know what to do. And I've been on that end of it, been in an ambulance, getting on dispatch saying, is there any other information? I don't see anything. Um, when in fact, there's major medical emergency happening around the other side of the building. So if we keep that in mind, um, having a waiver or having numbered doors and have that being part of your uh, your, your response is, is certainly very important as well. Um, your knowledge is 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 not ignoring that there's uh, there's this potential for and for need and ultimately that um that we have to keep people knowledgeable and within the plan and the participation for it. the preparation um, it is again not ignoring uh, that we need to we need to institute practices uh, to prepare for what we see as the most common medical emergencies that exist. Um, it's, it's the stuff we talked about on the pages before. The reasons why you would call 911, you should pay attention to that list of 18 to 20 things and make sure that you have policies and practice and equipment um, to make that preparation there. Um, the last of which is empowerment of your system. Um, lay rescuers that want to be engaged that are not necessarily medical professionals, we have to understand there are barriers for them getting involved and we can empower them um, through all of the first five things here to make sure that they are also responders within your system. With that, I think we take over some questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bart. This is really great Sorry about information. about the technical side of that. Oh, no, no trouble. I, I was about ready to, to jump in with my set of slides, but you took right over, so we're good. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, I've got uh, a question in from Kristen, and she's talking about the ABCs, Airway, uh, Breathing, and Circulation of Medical Care. Um, and it seems like as you're uh, speaking with your acronym, Marshy, that major bleeding might be ahead of airway emergencies. Could you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. I, it, this is one of the things I talked about um, towards the front of this. And when it comes to the timeline of medical emergencies and the, the ABCs are certainly no less important than they were when you were taught them um, with the CPR and the AD classes. Um, my suggestion is that w I think the first time we've heard about this is we went X A B C or X A B C Ds. The X standing for exsanguination, which is just another fancy term for massive bleeding. Um, so again, this acronym is only as good as um, is your interpretation of the acronym. But as we build this into a timeline, understanding that A B Cs certainly carry all the relevance and importance that they always have. But if we're instituting our best policies and practice, particularly when it talks about if we can get care on behalf of traumatic related injuries, we should look at that as a time frame. And the medical time frame when we're hunting for those priority ones in, that, in our triage system and making sure we're doing the best care has to start with the identification that there is not major bleeding. If there is major bleeding from an extremity, we have to be prepared to, uh, to, to mitigate that. And then after that, we talk about airway and respirations. And it can be a very quick turnaround but to not look for major bleeding as a, as a sign of your first traumatic problem is missing that opportunity. So the suggestion is that the M starts with massive bleeding. If it exists, we have to take care of that first. If it doesn't exist, we'll move on then to airway. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, a question in from Erin. Uh, she is, is asking, you mentioned an app in your presentation um, as, a, as a guide to management of patient decisions. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the app and how it works? Yeah, sure. There was um, the, the application I was referring to, um, the, the tool, so to speak. And again, we talked about some of the equipment and the preparation. Uh, in, in particular, the, what I'm trying to represent is the mobilized rescue systems. Particularly, this was the problem. Um, so again, I think the first slide I talked about, I was really surprised that there was some gap in our ability to respond, in particular ones that was several minutes. Um, so when we talk about engaging lay rescuers, one of the things that we needed to do is not only come, overcome the barriers when lay rescuers were involved, but talk about what type of equipment or training would they need. The application with the mobilized rescue system is a, uh, it's an app that's on the phone or an iPad or a tablet or an Android paired with all of the medical equipment that I just talked about um, to allow our lay rescuer who's familiar with that and the idea of responding to step-by-step step look at massive bleeding and airway and respirations and be asked a series of questions using something that's very convenient um, and probably familiar to everybody. So even if they're really nervous, and I'm guessing they will be, you take something that's really familiar to them, which is a touchscreen, whether it's a phone or an iPad or another device, and let them read a question and answer step by step. It's almost like a choose your own adventure book that I loved as a kid and allows them to step through the medical conditions so that we can tell them what is the next thing to do. So it's a catalog of medical information that allows them to intervene and being given then steps on how to manage bleeding. How to use a tourniquet, is that the right thing or not? So depending where the, the blood loss is coming from. Same thing with airway recognition, there's CPR steps, um, there's AED. There's fracture management, so there's a lot of medical conditions. Um, particularly, I talk about the reasons why we call 911. Um, that's one of the reasons why we built Mobilize, is to say, in this time frame of the gap, what are the reasons people call 911 and how can we give them the right tool to ensure that they're gonna do the best job possible while EMS is responding? Excellent, thank you, Dr. Bart. Um, question in from Laura. Uh, she's asking, you know, what is the best piece of equipment that a school can buy for massive bleeding? So massive bleeding, um, I think I answered that in one of the questions here of um, the type of equipment you need to do um, or be able to purchase as far as um, whether it's a system or it's individual, uh, making sure that your equipment is going to treat the right injury or the right, um, the right suggestion of injury. So in this case, um, for massive bleeding, when you talk about extremity blood loss, I'm not necessarily talking about a vein that got popped or there's a laceration, somebody might describe that as massive bleeding. And as a lay rescuer, if they say, I'm gonna put a tourniquet on that, as a physician, I don't get upset about that because I can. they can put the tourniquet on suggesting that there is major blood loss from an artery, which is what we're trying to stop. And I look at it and say, I disagree and I take the tourniquet off. I don't think, no harm, no foul. So when looking for the right equipment to purchase there, I think this is an opportunity for you to talk with your school health representative to see what you have on campus already and how we can possibly institute tourniquets and hemostatic gauze, whether it's a kit or if you just need something individually um, to make sure you're able to be the best responder on campus. If you have none of that, or if you just simply want to engage lay rescuers on it, um, try checking out the mobilized rescue systems as well to see how we can empower that lay rescuer with all of the right equipment already available in a kit and the instructions on a tablet or their phone to have access to allow them um, to respond to those medical emergencies. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, Christopher asks about presenting this training, and I think that the reference is in regard to this specific training that we're on. Um, would this be a good resource for high school students? I think absolutely. Yeah, 100%. So let me give you an example of this. Um, part of where we started with lay rescue response, um, many times it, it came out of concepts out of the West Coast. And, and one of the first times we were able to deploy this type of even technology and have this, uh, the response was a, a large college campus. And I talked about your responders capabilities of engaging people. So let me give you an example. They at that time had a handful, and let's say there was a dozen um, security officers on campus that were their major responders. So somebody pressed one of the emergency buttons or activated an alternate number, or even if it was 911, they were notified to respond probably with some sensitive medical um, equipment and an AED to respond to a campus emergency. With then, we, we're allowed to say, how do we engage lay rescuers? And in this case, we did use the mobilized rescue system. That's why it's an example. And strategically placed stop the bleed kits 
and some comprehensive or some smaller kits that um that are available and i, I think your school rep uh, school health representative can help you look at all of that stuff and place them strategically around the campus after that allowed access to the app on people's phones to every student faculty member or even visitor that came through airports do this too if you've ever been through baltimore airport they have like those cpr stations where you can learn how to do cpr while you're waiting uh, for your flights same idea how do we train people or how do we make them better responders what i was getting at with the school campus is that we went from having a dozen responders to having thousands of responders by simply providing them access to equipment using an application on their phone, they became part of the emergency response chain when they chose to be involved. I think that was a huge empowerment. And just the implications of that, of taking everybody on your campus and making them a potential responder is very exciting. Excellent information, thank you. Um, question from Jeanette, and this is likely to be you know, subjective because of the type of emergency you might be dealing with, but you know is there a ratio that you might look at for um, emergency bleeding supplies stop the bleed kits things of that nature uh, for a number of students like say you have a school of a thousand students um, how many kits might you want to have to be prepared yeah it's um you're always teased with that is how many is too many versus how much money did we have to spend on behalf of what we're dedicating for the preparedness um, and that part of it is very subjective. Um, everybody's going to feel differently about what their capabilities are. And understanding budgets are limits. Um, we we, under, we understand that completely, unless you have private donors that are um, a part of it. So part of your planning to go along with this is that I would say when you're you know, you're developing a system. So again, this is not just like a, how many band aids or ice packs do I have on hand because those are those are cheap. Um, and for most part, like you can't can't really specify how many of those you're going to use when re, when you're developing a a campus response plan. Um, again, your AEDs, I use an example here. And, and generally we've used, and I think the AHA has it as well. It's it's tough on the on the on your physical footprint of how large your campus is, or certainly how many people are on your campus. But the suggestion that while you're on a campus or in a school or in a building, that you can obtain an AED and get it and turn around back to the patient within the three minute time frame might give you some guidance. If we're talking about all of the other medical conditions and emergencies that exist. I think instituting that as your baseline might be a good place to start. So if you've got an AED hanging on a wall, um, hopefully it's not behind a locked office because that doesn't do anybody any good, but it's in an access accessible spot uh, on behalf of an emergency on your campus or in your school. And we're also pairing that with some system of massive bleeding, airway, respirations, um, all of those other medical conditions. If we can put them together and put them on campus, you may just start with how many AEDs do I already have? can I put a kit or some some device or some collection of medical equipment to respond to these emergencies? Can I put it right there and make this thing a total access system? Excellent suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Bart. And it looks like we're getting short on time. We have a number of questions here that remain unanswered, and I just would like to let everybody know that uh, we are recording the questions. We will reach out to you with an answer. So if you did submit a question and we haven't had a chance to get to it, uh, just know that we will be able to contact you with an answer. Um, we talked at the beginning of the program that we will be giving three of the Mobilized Rescue System Compact Kits away, and we have drawn three winners that are attending live. Uh, we've got Lisa from Ohio. Uh, congratulations, Lisa. We've got uh, Roberta from uh, South Carolina. Congratulations, Roberta. And we also have Robert from New Jersey. So congratulations to all three of you. Uh, we will be contacting you as well uh, to get those compact kits out to you uh, by Mobilized Rescue Systems. And that is the, uh, the presentation for today. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I hope that you found the, uh, the information to be useful. Um, big thanks to you, Dr. Bart, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. And, uh, and thank you also to our friends at Zoll Medical uh, for partnering with us today to bring uh, this presentation to you. As you exit the webinar today, you will see a survey window that, that comes up. Um, we'd ask you to please take a moment to take part in this brief survey uh, to help us understand you know, if, if you've liked what you've seen, if, if there's something that you would have liked to have seen differently, uh, please let us know. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and end the broadcast. Again, thank you everyone for joining.